Hey everybody, I'm CJ, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about Legion of Superheroes number one. Although, not specifically this Legion of Superheroes number one. Uh, I just want to use this mostly as a, as a starting point, as a uh, sort of point of comparison. Strange to think of it now, but there was a time when... Uh, Legion of Superheroes was one of uh, uh, DC's uh, premier books. This was one of their blue chip titles. In fact, there's a really strong argument that Legion of Superheroes and Teen Titans single-handedly kept uh, DC Comics in business through the late 70s and going right on through to the mid-80s. You understand? Basically what I'm saying is there's a really good chance, a really good chance, that DC Comics would have gone out of business if not for Teen Titans and Legion of Superheroes. And so important was the Legion of Superheroes in particular that they finally got their, their very first uh, number one. They got their not, in fact, not only did they did they get their own number one, finally, after all these years, but it was printed on high-quality uh, Baxter paper. The whole series was printed on high-quality Baxter paper. The, the series itself tends to be pretty well-regarded among fans, and just see for yourself. Just take a look at this stuff. This is, for its time, pretty conventional... Uh, uh, art, comic book art. This is these are pretty conventional uh, comic book page layouts f for their time. Maybe even slightly ahead of their time, but um, no, I would say these are th these are uh, pretty normal. I would say pretty conventional. And what you have is a team of superheroes doing superhero things. They're uh, zooming all around the galaxy. They're they're getting into fights. They're having rescues. Uh, you've got uh, the bad guys, and the bad guys are, are are plotting to somehow get the good guys, and so it's up to the good guys to make sure that the bad guys don't get a chance to uh, enact their evil plans. And this is perhaps superior, but it is still pretty conventional superhero comics. Like I say, lots of fights, lots of action. Uh, there's uh, intrigue and a little bit of suspense. There's some drama. There's a lot going on in this number one, and I would say in the Baxter series altogether. There's a lot of stuff that'll that would keep readers coming back month in and month out. And this this title obviously was designed to maximize interest in the Legion and basically make this property the very best that it could be. And as far as I can tell, it was a it was a tremendous success. This this volume of Legion of Superheroes is well regarded by Legion fans to this day. This is considered to be one of one of their high marks, maybe the high mark. And just again, just look at it. I mean, this is just very, especially for the '80s. This is just very um, conventional uh, su uh, superhero comics. <clears throat> And with everything that implies for superhero comics as published by DC in the 80s. But the, the Legion number one that I really want to talk to you about, like I say, it's not actually this Legion number one. It's this Legion number one. And the reason I want to talk about this is because this is volume four. Now, like I say, volume three, the Baxter series... This was very conventional Legion comics for its time. Very conventional superhero comics for its time. Legion of Superheroes number one, especially uh, from uh, volume four, this is not conventional superhero comics for its time. This was not completely atypical of everything that DC was publishing. I mean, certainly they'd gone kind of uh, dark and post-apocalyptic on certain other titles, but this was really the first time that creative risks like this were taken in a in a monthly. And the the basic uh, 
the basic concept behind uh, uh, Legion of Superheroes Volume Four, Number One. This is this series is kind of nicknamed the Five Years Later series, even though the the official storyline called Five Years Later. I think it only runs for like eleven or twelve issues, and then after that, you gradually start getting more and more back into mainstream conventional Legion of Superheroes uh, types of stories. You know, very conventional superhero types of stories, and but not from the jump. You know, when this series started, you, you, this was basically a tremendous creative risk on the part of DC. They basically uh, brought the Legion low. They, they basically took uh, the Legion that had been, you know, sort of the, uh, the proud standard bearers of the universe and they went in some very unexpected and very surprising directions. And probably the best example of that is the fact that there there really isn't a legion of superheroes as such anymore. The first few pages, uh, it, it, the first few pa pages explain what it was that happened, what was going on with the legion, and it's very much uh it very much gives the idea that the legion of superheroes at least at at least in this issue the legion is very much a thing of the past the legion no longer exists there is no more uh there is no more team the the former members are scattered literally all across uh the they're they're scattered all across the galaxy and during the 5 year gap it gets implied right here that there was some kind of a war, whatever this war was, it involved a cause, and this is just very much a uh, sort of uh, post, I can't say post-apocalyptic, but this is, there's a word and I'm not thinking of it, but um, maybe dystopic, but this is, Basically, you, you get the idea that um, Kaz's home planet is... It's basically like what Berlin was in uh, the 1950s, where you have all these different foreign powers that are occupying it. And eventually, it would, it would come down to only two foreign powers occupying it. But it was still occupied, and that's kind of what we're seeing here um, on uh, Kaz's home world, where... Uh, where as sort of the, the capital city of Brawl that this is where the enemy has uh, really set up camp and, and their occupation zones there's a lot of rebuilding that has just never taken place and so a lot of the damage from uh, the war with uh, Imsk is it, 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 it's just it's never been it's never been repaired and the reason I want to draw all of I want to draw your attention to all of this is basically just to kind of rhetorically ask with just look at the the number of creative risks that have been taken uh, with the Legion of Superheroes you don't even really see them in costume I think for the first uh, it's hard to remember maybe 13 or 14 issues I want to say it's at least that long before you start seeing the uh, uh, trademark Legion of Superheroes uh, costumes come back. Uh, it's got this kind of darker, grittier uh, type of setting and and style. And ask yourself, you know, how likely is DC Comics to take creative risks and chances like this today? And I guess with an eye on the future, how likely are they to take uh, risks like this in say two years from now if they're even still around how likely are they to take risks like this and the cor the uh, correct answer is probably not very likely at all <clears throat> but back in the 80s and this is my point back in the 80s you would see DC taking creative risks like this all the time uh, you had things like Frank Miller's Dark Knight where 
Frank Miller really could have broken Batman. I mean, he could have broken Batman beyond repair. Now, that's not what happened, but it is what could have happened. Um, Watchmen, same thing. Uh, Watchmen was a massive uh, financial and creative risk. Uh, that easily could have blown up in DC's collective face. Now it didn't, but it could have. And when it and the reason I want to draw your attention to the Legion of Superheroes is just number one, I'm a major, major Legion of Superheroes fan. And number two, this was a major risk to take with one of uh, DC's biggest cash cow, arguably their biggest cash cow. And number three, the storytelling uh, uh, risks and challenges that uh, Keith Giffen took upon himself, this is the kind of stuff that typically had only happened outside of continuity. At the time that Watchmen was published, it existed outside of mainstream DC continuity. At the time that The Dark Knight Returns was published, it existed at, and I think even now, it existed outside of mainstream DC continuity. This doesn't. At the time it was published, this was part of mainstream continuity. Now, it's not part of mainstream continuity anymore, but at the time that it, that, that it was published, before Zero Hour and the reboot that happened after that, this was, this was mainstream DC continuity. And as you can see, this is there are all manner of creative risks and chances that Keith Giffen was taking that honestly would not be possible today. I think at either of the uh, two big companies. I mean, this is, this just would not be possible, you know, and there's just no way, I would say DC especially, there's no way that they would let you take chances like this with any of their titles, because um, I don't really know if they even care so much about what their biggest selling titles are anymore, but they're definitely not going to let you take chances like this in in today's DC uh, comics publishing. I can't even call it a publishing empire, publishing community. And, you know, any times, because there are people out there who live in complete denial as to the sorry state of affairs with, with DC and just how bad things actually are telling you that, oh, no, DC's not in any kind of trouble at all. I, yeah, I mean, after all of these layoffs and all of these title cancellations, uh, key personnel who know how to make comics getting laid off such that there's probably nobody left at the at a DC anymore who knows all the steps of publishing a comic book. There are still people out there who are going to look you in the eye and tell you with a straight face, Oh no, DC's doing just fine. You know, every, uh, the, no problems here. Everything's all right. They exist. They're on Twitter. You can find them. And rather than the denial that those people are living in, just look at this comic book and and like I say, ask yourself, how likely is DC to publish a such a, a risk-taking comic book in today's world? And the answer to that is not fucking likely. And it just, it, it, pain, it, it pains me that we're never going to see this again. We're never going to see anything like this again. The days of DC being, I, I would even, I would almost want to compare DC to, uh, to, to uh, Warner Brothers, the uh, movie studio where Warner Brothers is known as the filmmaker's movie studio where if you if you make a movie for Warner Brothers, you're probably going to have full creative freedom. Well, there was a time when DC was kind of the same way, and I don't foresee a return to that probably ever. And how sad is that? So anyway, I'm CJ and that's that. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, make sure you're still subscribed, comment, like, and share this video because it really helps me out. Also, you can find me on Twitter at Cole Loves Comics.